Good morning. This is Pastor Jason Bratcher, and welcome to Hartford Baptist Church. We're glad that you've decided to join us today in our time of worship unto Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through singing of praise, sharing our tithes and our offerings, and the reading and preaching of the God-breathed Word of God. We invite you to come to our facility at 415 Liberty Street, Hartford, Kentucky, next to the Community Center. Our traditional service starts at 9 a.m., Blessed Academy, Sunday School, at 1015 a.m., and our contemporary service starts at 1115 a.m. The Kingdom Kids Ministry, or Children's Church, as well as our nursery is provided in our 1115 a.m. service. The registration table for those ministries is in our education wing and begins at 11 a.m. At Hartford Baptist Church, we're a community of grace, serving a community of needs. May God bless you through the services here today. Our offering, um, let me just welcome you uh, wholeheartedly, and I hope that you have had a great week. And uh, I hope that you are ready to, to worship our awesome Lord and Savior. Let's say our prayer. Father God, thank you so much um, for, for a beautiful day. Thank you that we can come here and just celebrate you and, and praise you. And, and Father, just to, to take everything off of us. Um, Father, we, we must decrease so that you will increase and that is my prayer today lord that you would uh, that you would be glorified in everything and every song that we sing and in every word of, of our speaker god thank you for who you are in your heavenly name i pray amen and that's exactly what he is an awesome god let's sing it out power we've got the power because we have Jesus in the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every time we'll confess haven't we read that that uh, that he is God we have the power i 
You all are familiar with this song. Let's sing it sweetly to our Lord and Savior, 10,000 Reasons. Yeah. 
may be seated. Good morning again, everyone. I'm doing double duty today. We want to welcome David Fig and Brian Miller. Uh, we appreciate you guys taking time from your church today and being with us. Uh, we especially appreciate the witness and testimony that you're sharing with us. I just uh, blew me away in the first service. Gave me a lot to thank and pray about. And uh, we just appreciate and we just welcome you to, to the pulpit. Thank you. Well, it's such an honor to be here. We thank you so much for the opportunity to, to get to speak. Um, Brian and I, we went on a trip uh, to Uganda um, a few months ago, a couple of months ago now, I guess. And uh, so we just wanted the chance to share and uh, tell a little bit about that trip and, the, and some of the stories that we experienced. So somebody uh, earlier mentioned us as missionaries. I'm going to clarify that. Um, we are not missionaries. Um, we did go on a mission trip, and we were ministered to, uh, but we are not the missionaries. And so this trip uh, went to Uganda, and so let's go through some logistics real quick. In Uganda, uh, sub-Saharan Africa there, it's the green country, right? beautiful country, right on the, the uh, border of Lake Victoria. And so we went there with parental care ministries. Um, and... I also will clarify that we have no real affiliation with parental care ministries other than a, a massive love and appreciation for them. Um, but we went there with them and the ministry uh, is just really amazing. So I've been to Uganda three times um, over the last couple of years. My first trip was probably about two years ago. And when I got there, uh, the one thing that strikes you the most is the poverty level in Uganda. So the, uh, I've been to several third world countries and I've seen poverty, but nothing stood out like this place. Uh, one of the, the key facts for Uganda is they have two and a half million orphans. So you're talking about a country about the size of Michigan and they have that many orphans. And you will literally be driving down the street um, and you'll see these kids just on the side of the road wandering around. Uh, no place to go, really. And it really is striking. It, it, it tears at your heart right off the bat. Uh, here's a picture of a little guy. This was a guy I, I saw walking along. Um, that's a machete in his hand. So you're talking about, what, three, four-year-old uh, with a machete in his hand walking along the road, nothing nearby. So that's really important to, to kind of share the start of PCM in, in this ministry because it started with a guy named Pastor Emmy. And this guy is a, uh, he's a pastor in one of the local villages. And he and his wife... Um, they kept taking in kids, so parents would pass away, there'd be this orphan left in the church or in the village, and they'd bring them in, uh, into their home. And so, over time, he and his wife looked up, and uh, all of a sudden they had 40 kids living in their home. And when I talk about a home, I'm talking about a little hut that's about maybe 10 by 10, and they had 40 children living with them. So... They sold their van, and they decided to buy a school. They needed to educate these kids. They needed a disciple to them. And so they bought a school, and they started uh, building what turns out to be this ministry. Today, this ministry is, um, it's got five schools. It's got 2,000 children in the schools. It's got 85 churches uh, with pastors in them. It's got a radio station that reaches 5 million people. One of their big things is this ministry is based in Uganda. And so it's not a, an American ministry that's trying to tell Uganda how to do things. This is a ministry based over there. And their goal is self-sustainability. They don't want us to just simply throw money across the pond and, and they have to live on that. They want us to help them get a leg up so that they can be self-sustaining. 
And some of the ways they do that, they've got chicken houses uh, to help feed the children. Uh, so the chicken houses produce eggs, and that's the protein for the kids. They've got baby houses, they've got a farming, uh, they've got crops of bananas and, uh, and various things. And so it's all about that self-sustainability. So I was there a couple of years ago, and I was there to, to kind of work with them on, on some leadership stuff. And in the breaks, we would go across the street to one of the schools, and we'd go hang out with the kids and, you know, love on the kids and just spend some time with them. And so one night, it was getting about sunset, the kids decided they wanted to go on a, uh, they wanted to go to the top of the mountain and worship with us. So, there's, here's my friend Madad. Madad latched onto me, and he decided he was going to take me up the mountain and go worship. And so here we go. He grabs my hand, holds my hand, and up we go. On the way, Madad says, you know what? I've got a, I've got a shortcut. You want to go with me. So oh, here's our mountain. This picture really doesn't do it justice because it was very much bigger than that. Um, <laughs> But Madad had a shortcut, so he was my man. I was going to go with him. So, up we go. Now, shortcut does not necessarily mean easier. It was shorter, but it was straight up that mountain. So you see all these guys over here, all these kids that are walking up this nice incline. Yeah, well, I'm over here uh, outside of the frame taking this picture. And we're trying to, you know, scale this mountain straight up. Um, needless to say, I'm not a mountain climber. This was not my forte. Um, I'm just a, a fat guy trying to climb a mountain. And <laughs> I was running out of breath. I was struggling. And Madad just kept my hand and kept saying step by step. And he stayed with me all the way up. So we get to the top of the mountain. Finally, I'm the last guy up. And all I see is stars. Now, it's not dark yet. I'm seeing stars because of that, that journey up the, tr up the mountain. I'm seeing stars because my brain has no more oxygen left in it. Um, but it was amazing. When I finally got my breath, when I finally could open my eyes and focus, this is what I saw. An amazing sunset in these children just standing there worshiping. These guys broke into worship like I'd never experienced before. It was uninhibited worship. It's not because some teacher told them to. It's not because they had some leader there saying, here we go. It's because that's just who they are. They led the worship. They didn't need somebody to say start. These kids just went at it. And it was amazing. They just started praising Jesus. When it's time to go back down, I just follow through a few of these pictures. This girl just standing off to the side in praise. So when we started back down, uh, it was time to go back, and they broke out into a prayer. And they prayed with each individual child, each person, praying uh, out loud their own prayer all simultaneously. And you talk about hitting you. Um, to stand in the middle of that and everybody be praying uninhibited like that uh, was just amazing. They had no worry. You know, we get, we get worried about what other people think. We get worried about what's, you know, is my singing good enough? Um, they didn't care. They weren't singing for the person next to them. They were singing for Jesus. And so, um, so then I came back and... A few months later, the choir came, so I'm back in Kentucky. So a few months later, they sent a group of kids over to the U.S., and they were touring through the U.S. Uh, just to kind of share this worship experience with folks in America. And they, they came through Kentucky, and they decided to stop in Beaver Dam, impromptu stop at Beaver Dam to hang out with us and, and say hi to us. And so I thought, I've got to have my family uh, and my friends experience this worship. So we had a little impromptu concert in the backyard, uh, invited some friends and family over so that they could experience that level of worship that I had experienced. And, and that's where Brian came in. Brian was one of those guys that came over, Brian and Amy did, and uh, 
Brian, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Can you? Oh, here we go. All right. So yeah, David. Uh, David had invited us over, and uh, man, we're in for a treat. Let me tell you. One thing I'm going to piggyback off what David said about their, their the way they worship. We went over there, and first off, uh, I still don't know what our mission really was when we went over there. To be honest with you, uh, we went. We didn't go build a school. We didn't go build a dentistry. We didn't go build some kind of clinic or we didn't do any of that kind of thing. It wasn't the kind of mission this was. This is just a partnership in worshiping Jesus. And what we did more than anything, I think, is the ones that went over, I think we had revival. I think we went over there and our spirit was, was just, I mean, I, I don't mind what's turned inside out. I just learned so much and it was just another step in my faith journey. Another step that God told me that I needed to go. And when I went, I realized that I couldn't sit on that experience and not share it with anybody else. So that's why I'm here today. It's just to share some stories. Uh, you know, uh, hopefully you get something out of it, but I know I am. Uh, just to share. It's just, it's just awesome. So one thing that they did when they worshiped, we went over there and we shared, uh, we shared a devotional with them. We went over there during Easter and we, that was our first weekend we was there was Easter, then the week following. And so we had a devotional set up, and we played some games with them, and we had activities, and we, uh, the one group shared songs with them, and uh, they made, uh, we made some uh, salvation bracelets and that kind of stuff, and just kind of, just gave them little activities to do. Whenever we would say the words like empty tomb, or we would say the words that Jesus died for us, or we would say Jesus Christ, they would stop what they were doing. And they would just yell amen or clap or shout or it was like we were at a Kentucky Louisville basketball game. But they do that for Jesus. When they hear Jesus' name, it is who they're cheering for. It's not a sports team. It's not, you know, whether somebody wins or loses or anything. They just yell Jesus' name. We went to, I didn't share this with the first group, we was at the high school and uh, we were there worshiping with them that last night, and um, they just broke out, and just one of the worship leaders, who was probably 15, and he's got more spirit than anybody, he was running up and down, and he was just saying, okay, we're just going to yell for Jesus. And let me tell you, it just broke out, and everybody's just jumping up and down, and yelling and shouting, and just yelling Jesus' name. And you, th you would think it was a basketball game or something around here. It was just, it was phenomenal. And that's, one that's something that I've never experienced in church before, is uh, just jumping up and down, yelling Jesus, and just screaming, and just proclaiming his name, and just, just in just all kinds, it was, just, it was amazing. So anyway, um, back to the choir. David and Meredith asked us to come over and uh, started. They, they sang and they danced and we ate with them and they introduced all the choir. And when they introduced the choir, there was a kid, there was a, guy, a guy, his name was Brian. And so when he introduced himself as Brian, uh, my name is Brian. So they said, hey, there's a guy named Brian sitting right there. And it was an instant connection just because of our names. He just came over afterwards and uh, started talking to us. It is in their culture to when you walk up and especially in a group like that uh, when we get to a school or whatever two or three kids would seek each individual out grab their hands and cling to them the rest of the day. I mean it's uh, Meredith and Andrew they were there they experienced that. They sit in your laps they just love on you and they're just I mean so they, they cling to you. Well Brian did the same thing to my wife and I. So we get there, and we're talking to him, and he tells us he's a street kid, and we really did not understand really what that was. He explained it a little bit, but we'll get into that a little bit more here in a minute. But he said, I'm a street kid, and now I uh, live my life for Jesus. So he was definitely a, uh, he was a servant. He would not let Amy and I take our chairs to our car. He wouldn't let us take anything. He did not let us carry anything. He wanted to grab it and carry it for us and serve us and love on us. And so we were getting ready to leave that night, and Amy wanted to take him home with us. And uh, 
she said, uh, he said, uh, you come, you come to Uganda and see me. And I kind of, I said okay, but kind of blew it off in my mind a little bit. Yeah, okay, that'd be great. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, I'd fly 4,000 miles and go see somebody in Uganda. You know, how would I do that? What would it do? But he was like, no, really, you come see me in Uganda. So that seed was kind of planted a little bit. And that relationship had started. And they don't take relationships lightly. Um, and I'll share that a little bit too. But uh, so the next slide shows the second time they came. So they came the second time and they came to our church and they toured some elementary schools. And that's a picture of some of them there at Horse Branch. And uh, David, uh, he asked some, a lot of us in our Sunday school class, he asked us if we would um, host a couple of the children if they could stay at our house that week. So we said yes, and the impact that that visit made on our lives will be forever. Hello? So, uh, next slide. Alex and Derek come to our house. And uh, those two guys, man. So Amy and I, we were kind of, about that time, we were kind of, I shared this story earlier, we were kind of talking about um, maybe getting a bigger house. We've had four kids of our own. They were all, they all moved out. Uh, they're all doing their own thing now and growing up. And so we thought, well, when they get married and they have kids and they have, you know, spouses and all that, then we need a place that they can all come to, they all can hang out. So we were talking about maybe buying a house basically for probably one to two days a year. And uh, Alex came to our house and he's the one in the green shirt. And he was walking around in our house, and he looked at Amy and I, and he said, Wow, you've got such a big house for just two people. And I looked at Amy, and I said, We're not, we're not moving. <laughs> he humbled us so much just in his, uh, he just put things in perspective for, for me and, and, and for my wife as well. A little, little Derek, man, that smile. He grabbed a little bar stool that we had in our house, and he would take that bar stool with him everywhere, and he would sit on it. Uh, he started calling my wife, mom, probably in about two or three hours. He made a connection with her. Uh, he sat there and watched her cook supper. He would take uh, the stool. He took it to our laundry room because we, we did our laundry for him. He took the uh, stool to the laundry room and set it in front of our washing machine and looked through the glass top of it and was just fascinated with the washing of the clothes. And he would not, he went and got a plate of grapes that we had and we asked him if he wanted a snack. He said, yeah, he came in and got his plate of grapes. We thought he would sit with us and eat and talk. No, he grabbed the plate of grapes. He went back in the laundry room and he said, ate his grapes, washed the laundry wash. Uh, He's just, he's awesome. Uh, I didn't share this, but when we got to Uganda and I ran into Derek, I said, hey, Derek, uh, that's good to see you, man. Did you ever think I'd come see you? No. And just, hold on. I mean, he's just had just an awesome, he just had an awesome attitude. Uh, but he, he was, he was wonderful. Uh, Alex, he, man, let me tell you, he had just had the spirit. It was just, it's just unmatched. Uh, the next day, or that Sunday, the next Sunday morning, we all came together and uh, we started sharing stories. My wife and I teach the class and we just pretty much threw the lesson out because everybody wanted to talk about their experiences they had with the kids from Uganda, with the choir. And so we got to talking and sharing and you know, we kind of talked about, man, their spirit was so infectious. Their love for Christ, the way they lived, we want more of that. So David, Mr. Action said, let's go. Let's do it. Let's put a trip together. We'll go in the spring. This was like September, October. He's like, uh, we'll go for Easter. So we just started planning and we had no idea what we were going to do. We had no, no end really in sight. We knew that we had to get to Uganda and we had to experience that love and that worship that they had for Christ. And we had, we had, had to have more of that. So it really, it really was a revival for, for me and I think for our team. Um, so that's what we did. That's why, that's why I went. Um, how I got there was one thing that I tell everybody was my church. Uh, we started going to church here in Ohio County in 2005. 
and the ministers that have been there, the youth leaders that's asked us to help and serve, and Sunday school teachers and deacons and uh, uh, ministers of music and the people that they brought in to share different ministry, a uh, different mission and ministry experiences, and all of that had fostered a uh, sense in me to me want to do something bigger than myself and me always want to serve. So, you know, a lot of people say, why church? Well, that's one reason. The church is a body of believers that comes together and encourages, and you just, it's part of your faith journey, and it's part of things that, um, it just, it equips you uh, to be able to go out and do other things. And this was one thing that I really, that I really learned while we were prepping to go was the power that my church had uh, and the influence they had for me. So that's, that's why church. That's why church is important. That's why God, uh, God caught it his bride. Uh -huh. So uh, because of that impact, we win. Well, I'm going to share a couple stories of things that really impacted me and things that changed my life and things that I prayed about and I said, God, don't ever let me forget this and I need to take Uganda back with me. I need to share it. So these are a couple stories that has a major impact on me. When we get there, uh, we go on Sunday morning, we go have church at Pastor Emmy's church, and then a, a man named Dennis asked us to come share, or come to his house. And so we came to, we went to Dennis's house, and we were got there, we got greeted by this band. And you cannot see exactly the details, but I'll point some of them out. One of them is that they don't have drumsticks. Those are sticks. Um... They're just whittled off of trees that just local, just fall into the ground. I mean, they're just, they're just sticks. Those symbols have cracks in them. Uh, he's got his hands wrapped in a piece of cloth that probably is an old t-shirt or something that he made for handles. Uh, the drums, uh, got a big hole in them. You see the tape over top of them. Uh, the trumpets are all dented, trombones bent, but it's the most beautiful music. Uh, it's just the spirit they have. And uh, Dennis, what Dennis does is Dennis ministers to a lot of kids, the street kids, and he ministers to them, uh, and he uses, he's, he uses music. He teaches them all instruments. If you ask any of the kids at Dennis's house if they play an instrument, they'll probably say two or three different ones, and they have no relation. They'll be like a trombone, drums, and a keyboard or something. Or it's kind of weird. It's not like, yeah, I play, the, I play the sax and the clarinet and things that's related. No. They just, they have just such a wide variety of musical talent. And he does a really good job at that. So I told you earlier that Brian was a street kid. So what Dennis does is Dennis teams with another minister called Pastor Willie, who was a street kid as well. And they minister to street kids. And what street kids are, I think it might be the next slide. Nope, not yet. You can go ahead and take a picture. Go to the next slide, though. These are all of the kids that are at Dennis's house, and these are all former street kids. So what Dennis did, what Dennis did is he felt a calling to open up his home, kind of like Pastor, uh, like Pastor Emmy did. He decided to open his home up and minister to these children. So him and him and Pastor Willie, they kind of uh, team up, and Pastor Willie gets them off the garbage piles, and he gets them clean, and uh, gets them to a point where they go to Dennis's house, and Dennis just takes over from there. And you see there, it's, I don't know, it's about 50 or 60 kids showing, but I think he's got like 80 to 85 kids living in his house now. And the whole compound and house will fit inside the sanctuary. Uh, it's a house, there's like 17 boys staying in a, a, a room that you would probably put two of your kids in. And he's got like three or four of those rooms. Uh, they feed out of a kitchen that is literally it's stones and a hoe that put a pot on it and you put firewood underneath it. That's the kitchen. Uh, but their, their attitude, Dennis's attitude is, God will provide. And we, that was demonstrated in his actions. He don't just say that. In fact, he didn't say that. Well, he did later on, but we noticed, we rep we, we noticed a uh, instance where uh, he just has the spirit of God will provide. And God does. God does for him. So he's also got a wife and three kids who live with the, all those boys. And two girls, I think, and a son. And for him to have the obedience and... Um, just the walk that he has to open up his home, 
to uh, 80 to 85 boys, probably ages 9 or 10 through about 20 to 23 years old. And they're all boys. For him to open his home up to that uh, and just have faith that God will provide and God will protect them and his family. It's just the obedience that he shared is just, it's just unmatched. It's just awesome. So, Dennis, uh, this really impacted me. It's probably one of the most things that impacted, impacted me the most. Um, and uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, and we'll start looking at some of the conditions that the street kids live in. So this right here is a street kid, and this is by a garbage dump. It's by a dumpster. They basically live on these piles, and they wait for the trucks to come in and dump so they can get food and clothes, and they find drugs or find stuff to get high off of or whatever it is. Um, and this is the conditions they live in. This, I mean, yeah, I told the earlier group that I'd, I'd, been, I'd served in the Army, and I'd been deployed uh, four times and a, cu a couple times to Iraq, and the thing that I've seen in Iraq doesn't compare to the things that you see that I saw here. And the impact that it had on me will never uh, be matched either. So these kids live on these, these piles and uh, this is their life. Go ahead and go to the next slide. This is us visiting a group of kids that was there and if you notice the kid in the red, sh red and tan shirt there with a stripe on he's got looks like a Mountain Dew bottle in his hand. So a Mountain Dew bottle is, has shoe glue in it, and they get this shoe glue from a shoe factory. And they shove that shoe glue down in that bottle, and they just constantly huff it. It's up to their mouth like this all, all the time. The whole time they're talking to you, it's just up here. And they've got a look in their face. You can just tell they're gone. I mean, their eyes, they're just gone. Brian, one of the street kids that we met at the uh, choir, he actually, we met up with him, and he's actually with us on this trip. And he was telling me some stuff, and he was over uh, right behind me, kind of whispering things in my ears. We were uh, ministering to these kids. One thing that he told me is it's, it's hard walking away from that life. Uh, he said it's, it's hard leaving here, but, it, but, but you can with the power of Jesus. But... He, he was like, that's the only way. Uh, he's just really, really hard. The reason why they get on those drugs and the reason why they huff that glue is he was telling me as well is one of the things that does that makes you forget. It makes you forget uh, their hunger was the number one thing he said. And they're so hungry because they're orphaned. David said there was two and a half million orphans. Most of them are boys because what they do is that culture is the boys will inherit everything that the family has uh, when, the fa when the father dies. So the father gets scared because what will happen is the, uh, the oldest son will kill the father eventually and uh, take everything. So they kick the boys out of the homes pretty early. And so you have these kids, plus it's hard to feed them. And so they just kick them out, and they kick the boys out because they can make money off of the girls. So they usually don't sell the girl. I mean, they usually don't kick the girls out. They'll sell them for marriage or other things. And, uh, but they usually keep the girls. So he just says it was really hard for the boys there. And the boys, they, uh, they huff the shoe glue just, just to combat... Uh, uh, hunger and loneliness and the feeling of, of being deserted. And, uh, there's another story. Um, David uh, noticed, recognized this guy here in the very front with his finger pointed. And David will explain a little bit of that. Yeah, Brian described the garbage piles pretty well. It's, it's, it's the closest thing you can imagine to hell on earth. I mean, these kids are, they're out of their mind. Um, they, it's the conditions that you can't imagine. And um, we walked up and we see these kids and we start talking to them and, you know, they're, they're, they can't form a coherent sentence hardly. Um, and I'm one of these guys that is kind of a running joke when I'm over there that I don't recognize people. All these kids want to come up and say, do you remember me? You know, I've been there three times. You remember me? No, they've all got the same haircut, they wear the same clothes, it's, it's kind of that thing, I, I never do. Um, but, when I was at the garbage piles with Brian this time, that little kid with the, with the hands up there, I recognized him. And I looked at him, I'm like, I know that kid. And so I looked over at him, I, I brought him over, I said, you used to be at Dennis's house. 
And he said, yeah. So this kid used to be at Dennis's, um, you know, on the path to uh, a better future. But the drugs were too big, and they, they were too, too strong for him, and he went back to the streets. And so I, I, I pulled him over. I said, I recognized you. I saw you at Dennis's a couple of years ago when I was there, and I remember you. And he just starts crying. His eyes focus in, and um, he's got a whole different look on his face. He starts crying. He takes this bottle that he's been sniffing on that's, you know, probably one of the most precious things he's got, and he throws it over his shoulder. He says, I want to go back. I want to go back to Dennis. And uh, so sure enough, Dennis let him go back uh, that afternoon. Go to the next slide. So when we get back to America uh, a couple of weeks later, Dennis sends me this picture of him. So this is the same kid. Um, reformed off of drugs, doesn't even look like the same guy. Uh, but just, just an amazing testimony to modern day miracles. Uh, so the main, one of the main reasons why I like sharing this story is because something that really hit me hard was, like I said, Brian was over my shoulder and he was talking to me. And when David described it perfect, it was the closest thing to, it was exactly what I thought when I walked away, that this is actually hell on earth. This is what it looks like. This is the fiery pit. Uh, this is what these boys feel like. Um, so one thing I realized walking away from there with Brian walking next to me, and I'm so glad he was there, was that there's no lost causes. Because Brian was just like that. Brian was on that garbage pile for a long time. And uh, now Brian, go to the next slide. Here's me with Brian. Brian is a high school graduate. He is doing very, very well. He is on his way to going to college, and he has aspirations of being a lawyer. So he went from living on that dumpster to now feathering his education and having dreams of continuing his education and definitely continuing his walk with Christ. So there's no... No lost causes because the first thing I thought when I walked up the hill and I seen those kids on that garbage pile was, man, these guys are long gone. Their eyes were just black holes and they were just glazed over. And it's like there's no way that our words are going to do anything to these guys. Brian told me, he taught me other things and God laid it on my heart as other things. That there's no lost causes. We see it every day in our life, in our society. We, I know I'm guilty of walking past somebody and talking to somebody and feeling like it's a lost cause. Just move on to the next person. So one thing, if we don't get anything else out of this Sunday morning, I hope that we understand that there's no lost causes. That God tells us that everybody needs to hear it. Everybody needs to hear God's word. And God has the power definitely has the power to heal. Uh, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. Another story, I'll make this one a little shorter, is the Pastor Kids ministry. And we were able to have them over for dinner one night. And the struggles that Pastor's Kids have over there are pretty unique, uh, probably to that, well, to the third world countries, probably of pastors. But uh, their kids literally um, I mean, they starve. Um, I mean, there's no other way to say it. They, they, they starve, they're hungry, they're pushed aside, uh, they're kind of neglected a little bit. And so there was definitely what happens is a lot of the pastor's kids, um, they move out of the house kind of early and they move away and they do not further their relationship with Christ. How they, what they relate to Jesus is my dad and my mom served Jesus and because they serve Jesus, I'm hungry. Because they, you know, being a pastor in Uganda is not, is not, is not like being a pastor here. Uh, a lot of them don't work. They pastor and they don't make any money. And uh, they, what they get, they give. So if a pastor gets something and his church members need it, he has given it right away. So his kids and his family sometimes are the ones that's suffering. So they do not, um, 
that's how they relate as a young age that's what they see and so they relate Jesus as something negative to them in their life so what Grace wanted to do and Grace is the daughter of Pastor Emmy is she wanted to stop that cycle and so she came up with and they developed a ministry called the the PK ministry the pastor's kids ministry and so this is another thing that really touched me uh, we had we had them over for dinner and at our hotel and they ate with us and then they started opening up and sharing some of their struggles with us uh, that was very very enlightening what I started thinking about was our church and our pastor's kids and who is discipling them but what they do is they they meet a few times a year they meet like three or four times a year and they have like those small meetings and then one time a year they have this big huge conference kind of like we would do like a vacation Bible school or a retreat or something like that and they do that with the, with with the PK kids and so with the pastor's kids I mean so they um, she, they were sharing with us and I started thinking about discipleship and what that what that means and what that looks like um, one thing that I say is I always pray that there's somebody in my kids life that will mentor them and and uh, minister to them uh, besides just me and my wife that there's somebody some kind of influence in their life some kind of Christian influence whether it be a mate whether it be a friend whether it be a teacher, uh, you know, a fellow co-worker, whoever, I pray for that all the time, that my kids will have somebody that will stand with them and support them and encourage them and disciple them. So in doing that, in praying for that, uh, I realized, and I realized that night how important it was for me to be that person as well. Because I cannot be praying for it for my kids to get that and receive that. If I'm, I know there's a lot of people that probably pray that for their kids. So I need to be that, I need to be a disciple as well, and a mentor, and a teacher, and somebody who loves and encourages other Christians. So that's something that really, really spoke to me, was discipleship. Um, I said that there's no lost causes, and the second point that I really want to make is we cannot assume anything. We cannot assume that the pastor's kids are being discipled. We can't assume that the youth leader's kids are being discipled. We can't assume that the deacon's kids or any kids in this church. We can't assume that the youth or that our fellow Sunday school mates are, for our, you know, the people we sit beside in the pews, the people that we see, we cannot ever assume, one, that they are discipled, and two, that they told that they really know Jesus. Uh, there might be some members of your church, there might be some people that sit beside you that you see every Sunday that you assume because they come on Sunday that they're saved and they have a personal relationship with Jesus, and we cannot assume that. We have a mission outside of these walls, there's no doubt about it. We also have a mission inside the walls as well. You know, God tells us, uh, you know, iron sharpens iron. And so we need to be that for each other. We need to be disciples. We need to be mentors. We need to be encouraging and loving on each other. And we need to make sure that, um, that, that all know the love and the impact of Jesus. So we really need to, you know, that's the two takeaways that I really want uh, to make sure we focus on. One thing that Grace does, and go to the next slide is they teach the pastor's kids, uh, they give them skills and trades so they learn how to uh, you know, make a little wage for themselves uh, so they can make a living. Uh, one thing they do is they make jewelry and they also teach them how to do uh, hair and makeup and just things like that. Things, they just teach them trades and Grace focuses on the ladies there. You could tell that uh, that's kind of what her passion is right now and they open up, they bought, they rented a little storefront there beside their house and she's following her dad's footsteps of opening up her home and her way and sacrificing uh, her needs for the betterment of, of others and she uh, uh, just teaches them uh, uh, skills and trades and helps them sell their stuff and it's just it's amazing what she's doing and it's a last slide here this is their motto this is the PCM's uh, motto proclaim comfort and multiply uh, we should always proclaim the name of Jesus and that's what they do uh, they comfort each other uh, they have clinics there and comfort and they have needs and, and they, they meet those. And like I talked about, about being a disciple, 
is multiply. This is not just their motto. This should be ours too. It should be the. It should be just uh, something that is embedded in our hearts as as we uh, as we go forward. So yeah, I will say you know as we go to a time of worship here that. Uh, Just surrender. Just take away your pride. Take away the feeling of what anybody thinks about you. Uh, surrender to God. And uh, just step forward and stop, start serving. Uh, I ask that you go to a time of prayer and uh, you just bow your heads. You respond the way that God wants you to respond be there in your seat. You might want to come to the altar to pray. You might want to make a public proclamation of your faith following Jesus. Whatever it is, I just pray that you soften your heart and let God pierce it. All God wants is, is eternal fellowship with us. He just wants us to be in heaven with Him. He wants to laugh with us. He wants to love on us, encourage us. He wants us to live a life eternally with Him in heaven. And it's real simple to gain that fellowship. Just believe in His Son, Jesus. Just believe what Jesus came to earth to do for us and then proclaim that comfort and love others and let's disciple them let's multiply that so dear God that's my prayer that we follow you Jesus' name I pray, amen.
thank both of you. Yes, give them a round of praise. Praise to the Lord. Great ministry. I know uh, uh, some of you may be wondering, and here Brother Jason was hoping to be here today in attendance. Uh, his recovery has been a little slower than he'd liked. He's been having to deal with a little more pain. Uh, he has a follow-up visit with one doctor Monday and another one Tuesday. Hopes to be back in the office Wednesday. So, uh, and when the pastor's away, the numbers fade. <laughs> But we still like, we thank you so much. We're two or more are gathered. God gets the glory. So we thank you so much. If you guys have any, uh, I didn't say this in the first service, if you have any questions for these gentlemen or want to see how maybe you can get involved, they're open to sharing that with you. Uh, and just uh, continue to pray for them in their ministry. And I, I thank you so much for your heart. Let's bow in a word of prayer and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much uh, for this glorious day that you've made. Father, I thank you how you bless us so much and we take so many things for granted. <laughs> that we have the homes we have where two of us are, are living in a home that is bigger than 85 people can even gather in. Father, I just uh, I ask that you help us to share in generosity as our, our Sunday school lesson said this morning. Share the generosity that you've given us. Share the wealth, the love. How you, you came down this earth from heaven, the right hand of God, and didn't think it was too much that you could do it for us. Father, I thank you so much for this day. I pray that our worship has been pleasing in your sight. Lord, I pray for those that are out and about, again, we pray for the preacher and his family. We pray for Jonathan and Amber as they're on travel, uh, traveling mercies for them and their family. Lord, we just ask that you return them to us safely. Father, I thank you so much for this day, and I ask that you give a special blessing to David and Brian and their families for, for being able to share, being unafraid to share what you are doing in their lives and what you have used them to do this far. For I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening today to Hartford Baptist Church. Again, we're located at 415 Liberty Street, Hartford, Kentucky. Services at 9 a.m. traditional, 1115 contemporary, with Blessed Academy at 1015. Nursery and Kingdom Kids available at 1115. If you would like to know more about our church, give us a call at 270 298 
3701. Our office hours start Monday through Thursday at 9.30 a.m. Like us on Facebook or go to our website. Have a blessed day.